Chapter 30. A bit at a time, we pieced together what had happened. The Americans had dropped two bombs at Japan. The bombs were said to have been powerful enough to destroy half a city. At first, no one could believe this. Half a neighborhood, perhaps, or half a major military base. But if Julie eventually confirmed that half the city of Hiroshima had indeed been destroyed on August 6th and half of Nagasaki three days later. A week later, the emperor had surrendered to the United States and its allies. The American forces had landed in Korea to help supervise the handover of the government and the Japanese were fleeing. During the war, there had been no battles in Korea, but now that the war was over, the fighting began. Koreans were taking their revenge on the Japanese. The Japanese were fighting back, and the Americans were trying to keep order. There was chaos everywhere. Amoni wouldn't let me leave the house. I spent a lot of time standing at the gate and watching what was going on in the street. How strange the Americans looked. They are much taller than most Koreans, with long legs and huge feet. Their faces were either so white I felt I could almost see through their skins, or so red they looked as if they'd be hot to touch. Their noses were enormous, and I wonder if they could smell everything better than we could. Abdui went into town one day, soon after the emperor surrendered, to collect something called a ration package. When he brought it home, Amoni and I crowded around him. He set it down in the courtyard. It was a dark green box that came up to my knee in height. It was about a meter long. The green color was the same as the Americans' uniforms and the rumbly cars, which they called jeeps. The box was made of cardboard coated with a shiny substance. Whatever this was, it sealed the box so well that at first we couldn't open it. Abjui scratched the surface and examined his fingernail. Wax, he said, to keep out the dampness. Moni fetched a knife from the kitchen. Abjui scraped away at the wax until he could tear open the box. Smaller boxes and canned packages were inside. Amoni took them out and examined them one by one. You couldn't tell what was in the cans. There was writing on them, but it was in English. There was a stack of crackers. There was even a bag of rice. Amoni drew in her breath with a whistling sound, tore open the bag, and poured some rice into her hand right then and there. It was rice to be sure, but like none we've ever seen before. Thin grains rather than round stubby ones we were used to. I almost laughed when I saw this. Even American rice was long and skinny. Abjui let out a surprise sound when Amoni handed him a carton of cigarettes. He used to smoke before the war, but I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen him with a cigarette. There was also a small yellow package about the size of my two fingers. A sweet smell rose from it. Amoni sniffed it and handed it to me, not smiling. She never smiled anymore, but with a kind look on her face. I opened the package to find five thin rectangles of foil. I offered one to Abjui, but he was already smoking a cigarette. Amoni and I each took one of the rectangles. We opened the foil, and there was a flat white stick inside. Amoni licked hers. Candy, she said. Go ahead, eat it. It was delicious, but there seemed to be something wrong with it. At first it grew softer, but then it became quite rubbery. And though I chewed my piece for a long time, it never broke up into pieces small enough to swallow. I swallowed it anyways and almost choked as the rubbery lump went down my throat. Amoni frowned and took hers out of her mouth, examining it closely. Not for swallowing, she said. It must be something for chewing, the way people chew tobacco. I learned later that Americans call it gum, and that Amoni had been right. It wasn't for swallowing. For a few moments, it had been a welcome distraction, but then I thought about how I wished Tayul was there to share the gum with. The pleasure brought by the ration package dissolved in an instant. How was it that even something strange and new reminded me of him? During the next few weeks, Abjui often brought home some kind of food. In town, there were workers and soldiers who gave out more rations. Not bags of rice, but bags of flowers and beans. We were eating better than we had in years. One day, as we were finishing dinner, Abjui said that the Americans were assisting with large evacuation of Japanese civilians. I looked up for my bowl of peaches. They were from one of the ration cans, almost unbelievably luscious, cooked in some kind of sugary water. I was sure he'd learned about this latest news from Tomo's father. The Tomo was among those to be evacuated. The next day, I slipped out of the house and made my way down the street to Tomo's house. He was outside loading a crate onto a cart. An American soldier was standing guard at the gate. Tomo? He turned in surprise. Kyoko, what are you doing here? 
For a moment, I didn't respond. I was thinking about how he called me by my Japanese name. We'd all gone back to using our Korean names the very day the emperor's surrender was announced. Indeed, as part of the celebration in the street that day, people had torn up their Japanese identity papers. But Tomo had been calling me Kyoko for five years now, but it felt strange to hear him call me Sunhi. I wasn't Kyoko anymore, but the part of me that was friends with Tomo would always be Kyoko, and I didn't want to forget that. I heard you were leaving, I said. I came to say goodbye. He nodded. We're going to Japan, to Tokyo, I think, he sounded unsure. Then I realized Tomo was leaving the only home he'd ever known. He'd visited Japan a few times, but had never stayed very long. What must it be like for him to be moving to a country that was so strange to him? A country surely broken and devastated by war? Such an uncertain future awaited him and his family. He looked down at his feet and spoke, spoke hoarsely. I heard about your brother. I'm sorry. My throat closed suddenly. At home, we hadn't even mentioned Tayul at all. To hear someone talk about him was a terrible shock. There were things I planned to say to Tomo, but my mind was empty now. I reached out and put the gift I'd bought him into his hand. Travel well, I mumbled and fled back up the road. I'd given him back the stone, the one he'd given me at the night. He came to warn me about the metal raid. I hoped it would remind him of my gratitude for that night. He tried to help, and it wasn't his fault I'd made such a terrible mistake. Maybe it would remind him of all the good times we'd had together when we were little, and it was a tiny piece of Korea to take with him wherever he was going. Every day I spent hours watching the road. It was partly out of pure greed. The American soldiers often threw gum, and one time a wonderful sweet called chocolate, which tastes so good it made me want more. Standing at the gate also seemed to make time pass. Each day was much like the one before, and it helped to be able to lose track. Otherwise, I ended up thinking in time in terms of Taiyul. It was so many weeks since he left, so many weeks since his first letter, so many days since his second, leading my thoughts to where I didn't want them to go. Always, I was searching for the road for Uncle. The war was over, the Japanese had been defeated, and there was no more need for an underground resistance. Probably he'd been somewhere far away when the war ended, which is why it was taking him so long to make his way back. If only Uncle would come home, the house wouldn't feel so empty anymore. It was the middle of September. A month had passed since the surrender. I heard someone call from the gate and went to meet the visitor. I stopped partway down the path, for at the gate I could see an American soldier. I hesitated and half turned back toward the house, but if Dewey wasn't home and I couldn't very well ask Amoni to come out, she couldn't greet guests while in mourning. A soldier called out something in English and smiled, a friendly smile. That was another thing about Americans. They all seemed to have such big white teeth. I forced myself to walk the last few steps to the gate. He handed me a parcel wrapped in brown paper. He said something else and gave me a half wave, half salute as he left. I breathed a sign of relief that it had been such a quick visit. Whatever would I have said to him? I took the parcel into the house. It couldn't be more rations. It was flat like a big thick envelope. On the front, there was some Korean lettering. I squeezed the parcel, trying to feel what was inside. It felt like paper, many sheets of paper. Amoni came out of the kitchen. She took the parcel and put it into the sitting room to await Abjui's return from the school. I was in the kitchen when I heard Abjui's steps in the entry corridor. I hurried into the sitting room, fetched the parcel, and handed it to him. He didn't open it right away. He went into the sitting room, set it down on the table, and put his things away. I stood by the door trying not to fidget. A parcel with Korean lettering. Maybe it was from Uncle. Abjui opened the wrapping. A piece of paper fluttered to the floor. I darted toward him to pick it up. He leaned over at the same time and we nearly cracked heads. As he straightened, holding the paper, he looked at me a little impatiently, but he didn't ask me to leave him alone, so I stayed. The parcel held newspapers, several of them, and the piece of paper was a letter. Please ask your mother to join us, Abjui said. I was back with Amoni in less time it took him to refold the letter. It's from a Miss Lim, he told us. I met her once before the war. She writes that she was the head of a resistance group and worked with my brother. He paused for a moment. I pressed my lips together so questions weren't burst out of me. Uncle, did the letter say anything more about him? And beneath that, another thought. A woman working for the resistance? I could hardly imagine such a thing. What did she do? Did she do dangerous things? Spying, delivering messages? How exciting it must have been. And what did her family think of her? 
but that wasn't as important as hearing about uncle. Abdui looked at the letter and continued. She says that after my brother left here, he kept printing the newspaper. He hid it in different places, but eventually things became too dangerous. The Japanese were still looking for him. The resistance underground smuggled into Manchuria, where there was a headquarters for the movement. Miss Lim received word after the war ended that he would be leaving Manchuria to return to Korea, but that was the last news she had of him. She says that the communists are making things very difficult in the north. They have seized control and are allowing no travel except for official business. He looked at Amoni and cleared his throat. It's likely that my brother is there now in the north, but unable to come home. She says she will write again to us if she hears any more news. The empty feeling in this house suddenly filled up my whole body. I thought of what Amoni had said to me so long ago, that I would someday be able to forgive myself for my mistake, that there were times when I thought I had, but now I felt the old guilt welling up again. Uncle wasn't coming home soon. No one would even know where he was. Abdui turned and put the letter away in the chest in the corner of the room. Then he looked at us again. Her letter says one last thing that we may want to tell Mrs. Ahn that Uncle escaped safely all those years ago. Mrs. Ahn? Abjui nodded, as if he spoken out loud. Do you recall the accounting just after my brother disappeared when our home was searched? There is a secret cellar in Mrs. Ahn's garden. He hid there for two nights. She helped several other resistant workers in the same way. Old, lonely Mrs. Ahn? The Japanese never suspected her. If I hadn't felt so sad about uncle, I might have laughed out loud. That night, I ate almost nothing of my dinner, just pushed the food around on my plate. Amoni must have noticed, but she didn't chide me. After I helped clean up, I went back into the sitting room. Abjui was looking at the newspapers. Without my asking, he handed me a few of them. As I took them, I felt a little thrill break through my despair when I thought about uncle printing these very papers. The articles were written in both Japanese and Korean. If they'd been in Korean only, many people wouldn't have been able to read them. I skimmed the headlines looking for something especially interesting. It would be good to read something to take my mind off the emptiness inside me. Here was one about the education system. That might be good. I was eager for school to begin again. The article talked about the future for Korean students. It's useless to regret all the hours our young people have been spent educated in Japanese. Instead, we must look to find areas of strength through which their pride in learning can be further nurtured. Kanji, for example, is based on Chinese characters that have long been a source of esteemed scholarship for our people. When Korea is free at last, students should turn the dedication and knowledge acquired through learning kanji to the study of their own language and to the classical literature of our country, much of which is written in Chinese. I heard these ideas before. Stunned, I looked again at the top of the article. There was no author's name given. I lowered the paper a little and looked over the top at Abjui. Our eyes met for only the briefest moment. His face was expressionless, and he didn't say a word. He didn't need to. I could figure this out with no help at all. A few afternoons later, Amoni and I were in the garden weeding. My hands made the right motions of digging and pulling, but my thoughts were elsewhere. Since we received Tayu's last letter, the death letter, that's how I thought of it, I hadn't written a single word in my diary. It was as if my mind was working fine. I could enjoy our meals these days and look forward to school starting again, things like that, but my heart was still empty. I never felt quite like writing again. I wondered if I ever would again. We heard the honking of a jeep's horn from the road. The Americans seemed to like honking their horns. They used them not in mourning to clear the road, but as a greeting too. When two jeeps were going in the opposite direction on the road, their drivers honked as they passed each other. It seemed quite friendly, but also very noisy. This time, though, the honking seemed to be coming from right outside our front gate. It kept on, loud and insistent. Amoni was still wearing her morning dress. She looked at me and nodded toward the road. The honky stopped and the jeep roared off as I was fiddling with the rusty latch on the side of the gate. Then I heard Amoni cry out, a strange choked cry. Startled, I looked back at her. It was the first sound louder than whisper I'd heard her made in weeks. 
I saw her standing there in the vegetable patch. She threw her arms out wide in front of her, waved them wildly, and made that sound again, half screaming, half choking. What was wrong? My heart leapt in alarm, and I rushed toward her. But before I could reach her, she began to move, to run toward the house. It was as if time had stopped. It was as if the air had turned to water, and all movement was thick and slow. Amoni running, me looking first at her, and then at the house, at Tayul, coming back out the back door.